epidemics um, um, through those periods, most of the major ones. And uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples and just highlight some of the Ontario, major Ontario ones, uh, most notably 1937, uh, 53, 51 as well. I don't have them listed because it sort of gets obscured, but 51 was another major one, but I'll give you a sense of that. So this is uh, just clipping from 1930, kind of giving with just a sort of sense of the tragedy that was happening in many ways. This was before our lungs were available. Actually, in 1930, there was only one in Toronto. And unfortunately, this particular young child uh, didn't, uh, there was no lung available and she passed away at a pretty young age. So let's just give you a kind of sense of that. And that we're experiencing that kind of thing right now with COVID. Uh, uh, we just heard about a 13 year old girl dying of COVID and from uh, Brampton just yesterday. So, um, and then in 1937, that was the uh, worst epidemic in Ontario history. Um, Toronto being particular uh, focus of it and, and Burlington and then the GTA area particularly. And just to give you a sense from the kids hospital, uh, just uh, lots of kids. Uh, in those days they used what were called Bradford frames, very uh, um, kind of keep people from not moving. <laughs> um, and then the iron lungs. Uh, this one was built in the basement of sick kids hospital. Um, there were 27 of them built in the basement there during the midst of the uh, height of the polio epidemic. Uh, it was a major uh, exercise in that story there. Um, so I, I, can, I don't have time to get into that story here, but just want to give you a sense of it. And then uh, 1951 uh, was another uh, significant outbreak in, in Ontario. Um, and then you can see here the clipping or a bit here with Neil Young. This was mentioned in my introduction. I blame my whole polio story on Neil Young <laughs> based on this chapter in uh, the book by his father, Scott Young, Neil and Me. I'm a big Neil Young fan, and I wrote a paper about it uh, in a class in 1988 when I was going to Western Ontario, University of Western Ontario, um, and wrote about Neil's case based on what his father wrote about it, because he wrote a, a nice sort of uh, piece at the time he went through the experience. Neil's polio wasn't particularly uh, unusual, it was had its uh, impact on him, as well as Joni Mitchell, as well, she had a similar kind of story. So, Anyway, I just want to give you a sense of that. But again, the uh, clippings, there's lots of sad stories about uh, the impact of polio. Uh, in this particular case, two sisters um, died of polio. Um, so, and I'll talk a bit more about 1953, uh, although not Ontario, but in Manitoba a little later. So to kind of get us into gear with the vaccine, you have to kind of begin with Franklin Roosevelt. In 1921, he was stricken by polio while vacationing in New Brunswick. Uh, 19, uh, as you probably know, Roosevelt, he was a senator at the time and later became president. In 1938, as president, Roosevelt founded the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, or the U.S. March of Dimes, to sponsor polio research and provide support to polio victims. In 1948, sort of a decade after the beginning of the U.S. March of Dimes, a Canadian, or March of Dimes, then known as the uh, Canadian Foundation for Poliomyelitis, was founded, kind of inspired by the U.S. Uh, story and later restructuring in the provincial bodies like the Ontario March of Dimes, or March of Dimes Canada today. So there's a whole story about that I don't get into here, but uh, March of Dimes, U.S. March of Dimes was very significant to the, the broader story, as you're probably aware. So, but in the Canadian context, uh, while well, the Americans had Roosevelt, we had Paul Martin, uh, although now prime minister, he was close to being prime minister. Um, so worsening polio epidemics sort of in the post-war era, especially after World War II, put a huge strain on the Canadian public health and hospital infrastructure. Uh, the ability of provincial governments to pay for specialized polio care services became acute. Actually, in the earlier epidemics, especially in Ontario, there were uh, the provincial governments play, were quite active in, in, in supporting polio services, making the, paying for the iron lungs, paying for hospitalization care at a certain level. Other provinces did similar things. So by this time, this was a, a major challenge. Uh, in 1948, the federal health minister, Paul Martin, introduced annual federal health grants of $30 million to boost provincial health services. But Martin himself had personal experience with polio, like, like uh, FDR, although not quite as visibly. Uh, Paul Martin, he, he was stricken with polio in 1907 as a young child. And then importantly, his son, Paul Martin Jr., who later became prime minister uh, in the summer of 1946 when he was about eight in Windsor, Ontario. He had a significant case of polio. And this happened, uh, Paul Martin Jr.'s 
polio case happened just as Paul Martin became health minister, Na minister of national health and welfare. And this all helped catalyze the inclusion of expanded public health research into polio into the new health grant system. And then after, if you happen to remember, there was a W5 piece uh, back in uh, November and Paul Martin was interviewed for that as, as was I. And, and here, here's Paul Martin Jr. talking about uh, relating polio with COVID. And then uh, I did a, I was interviewed and was featured in, in a little document, a documentary on W5 back in the end of November. And here's just a preview of that. Lessons learned. They'd be in terrific pain. From a deadly childhood disease. For parents, it was a nightmare. W5 reveals how the polio virus Were people suspicious of vaccines back then? may provide clues for the COVID pandemic. I'm very worried about that. As survivors share, it was enormously painful. Their harrowing stories. I will never forget the feeling. And all new W5, Saturday at 7 on CTV. So uh, that's lessons good. learned. They'd be in. So that, that's available on YouTube or on the W5. Uh, website so it's still available it's, it was a good quite a good documentary piece i had a feature on w5 uh, mostly about the experience of polio and um and then there was the interview was done up in kingston um, museum of Healthcare in kingston there's an exhibit there on history of vaccines that i curated and we has that has one of those 1937 iron lungs and uh you'll see it in the documentary so anyway uh, polio incidents grew alarmingly after world war ii and especially during the early 50s fueled by the baby boom with Western Canada hit particularly hard in 1952 and even harder in 1953. Some 9,000 cases and 500 deaths were reported across Canada in 1953, affecting Ontario and all provinces, but with Manitoba worst hit. Most alarming were the numbers of bulbar polio cases, so involving, our, especially among adults, bulbar cases are the ones that lead to iron lung or respiratory distress, basically. And Manitoba was the, uh, many cases, in many ways, the uh, hardest hit ever by polio. Um, so although the whole COVID experience has kind of <laughs> changed how to sort of view this, but uh, before COVID, this sort of experience was one of the worst, uh, last major epidemic experience we had in Canada. Uh, that's equivalent to, at least at some level. So, and, and I, uh, there was a major iron lung crisis, kind of like what's happening with, uh, you can see what's happening in India right now and, and what's happened with COVID uh, in Canada in various, various times earlier on, especially. At the peak of the polio crisis, an overwhelming 90, iron, 90 cases were dependent upon iron lungs in Winnipeg's King George Hospital. And, and, and the 53 polio crisis prompted emergency flights of iron lungs by the Royal Canadian Air Force. And there were similar polio sieges in other Canadian hospitals in 1953, especially in the West, Western provinces, most notably in, in Edmonton. So again, after going through, and what we're still going through with COVID, this kind of still resonates in a certain level, obviously. So, but we'll focus on the vaccine story. Um, so Connaught Labs is the uh, major focus of, of what I'll be talking about here. It was established as a self-supporting part of the University of Toronto to provide essential public health products starting in 1914. <clears throat> the initial products were diphtheria antitoxin. Uh, growth, there was major growth in World War I. Uh, the current site uh, on Steeles Avenue in Dufferin uh, began and uh, was officially opened in 1917. Um, by the 1920s, uh, Connaught played a key role in development and production of insulin. This was mentioned, I'm very much involved with insulin. Uh, for the 100th anniversary. Um, a new stamp disc came out uh, two weeks ago. Um, if you might have noticed, I was involved with that, the uh, inclusion of an artifact insulin vial on it, so you can uh, go out to your post office and pick up a stamp. Um, it turned out quite nicely. And in the 20s and 40s, uh, polio are, cannot played a major role in the development and production of diphtheria toxoid, heparin, and penicillin. And in 1972, it was sold by U of T, and today is known as Sanofi Pasteur Canada. <clears throat> and this is what the uh, front of main entrance of the site looks like today. It's called Heritage Square. The original buildings there um, were built in the World War I period. And uh, I have an office in the bigger one there. And the Heritage Room is, is in that building as well. So it looks a little different now with COVID. Uh, there's a, people have to go through that building to get their temperature checked. And it's a process to go on to the site. So it's, uh, but it's a major uh, site. Uh, it's a brand new building was just announced. Uh, a few weeks ago for influenza production and also potentially for COVID production. 
Um, so it's and there's another big building that's nearing completion for bacterial vaccines. So it's a, a major facility and it's been continuously involved with vaccines for 100 years, um, despite changes in the uh, ownership and name, but the legacy is still very much there. Um, so anyway, so by 1947, uh, Dr. D Andrew J. Rhodes here, he launched a comprehensive research program at Connaught to investigate the virology, epidemiology, and immunology and clinical diagnosis of polio. Uh, Dr. Rhodes was a leading uh, virologist globally at the time. He was recruited from Scotland, um, and he was one of the uh, experts on poliovirus at the time. And also in 1949, hopes for a vaccine were raised when a research team in Boston, led by Dr. John Enders, discovered a way to grow poliovirus in test tubes, which was a major breakthrough. But also around the same time, in 1948, winter of 1948-49, one of Rhodes' most significant projects involved investigating a highly unusual polio epidemic that struck Chesterfield Inlet on the western shore of Hudson's Bay, with the Inuit community severely affected some 60 cases and 13 deaths among a population of 275, with mostly adults stricken. So very little about this outbreak fit what was known about polio at the time, especially it's striking so far north in the middle of an Arctic winter. You know, polio was thought of, oh, it's a summer disease and, and with kids mostly. And so this really flew in the face of that. So it's, it's a really interesting story. Uh, and I've read, written an article about it in Canada's History Magazine. Um, I have a link on my own website. Hopefully it'll be posted uh, available freely on their own website, but still it's, it's uh, a number of elements in that story are quite important. So anyway, um, but in fact, Rhodes' uh, Arctic polio investigations ultimately brought questions, not of climate or Inuit food habits, but of human immunity to the fore, underscoring how the polio virus was widely distributed globally, even into the Arctic. Yet this distribution had significant demographic and geographic gaps in countries with the most advanced public health infrastructures. And it was in such gaps that polio epidemics could be generated in any community. This advance in understanding the disease was a critical step towards development of, a pol of polio vaccines. So, which explained a lot of just why polio was getting worse in a sense. Um, there were pockets of vulnerability essentially, and the virus ultimately would get there and, and would, would spread and cause epidemics basically. So I mentioned before hopes for a polio vaccine were raised uh, when a group in Boston discovered a way to grow the, the virus in test tubes using non-nervous tissue cultures and this discovery earned a Nobel Prize for Dr. Andrews' group and a further advance was discovering the polio virus was in the bloodstream or was during the course of the uh, of the virus in the body it was in the bloodstream in addition to the gastrointestinal tract, pointing to two systems where a vaccine could be targeted. And so meanwhile, in 1949, Connaught's research team, uh, led by Dr. Raymond Parker, developed what was known as Medium 199, which was the first chemically defined tissue culture medium, originally for nutritional studies of cancer cells. So before this, uh, they were using a kind of a hodgepodge mixture of uh, animal sera and various ingredients to grow cells, to grow the virus. And that was fine in a lab setting in a small scale, but you couldn't make a vaccine from that. And so this group uh, developed Medium 199, originally for cancer cell nutrition studies to be able to measure how much a cancer cell uses. So if you have a media, you know exactly what's in it. You could therefore measure what the cell uses and doesn't use. So this was a vital uh, contribution just in and of itself to uh, tissue culture media generally and the whole media uh, industry, I guess you could say. But it was a critical step in the polio story, got connected to the polio story through this man, uh, Dr. Franklin, who worked with Rhodes. So in early 5051, Rhodes was growing polio virus in test tubes using Ender's method, but was reliant on the traditional animal-based tissue culture sera, which you couldn't, again, as I said, use in a kind of vaccine. And through his friendship with Dr. Morgan, who was the lead um, biochemist on the uh, Medium 199 team, a member of Rhodes' research team, Dr. Franklin, tried a new synthetic medium for cultivating in tissue, poliovirus and tissue cultures. So they were both young bio, PhD biochemists and, and uh, met at a um, Connaught seminar and started talking about what they were each doing and Morgan suggested using 199 for polio. And use of, the use of this medium vastly improved the yields and purity of poliovirus cultures. So this was a, a major step because meanwhile, uh, Around the same time, Dr. Jonas Salk had shown that an inactivated poliovirus vaccine could prevent polio in monkeys. 
and he was using the old the older media so but in a lab setting with with monkeys it was able to at least show this was possible and news of cannot serum free meeting 199 and its use for polio virus cultivation opened the door for salk to develop an inactivated polio vaccine that was safe to test in humans however salk can only make his vaccine on a small scale so Kanat came through again, uh, I'm starting in 52, Kanat's lab's Spadina building. So if you know U of T campus uh, or college Spadina area, you might have seen or gone on a streetcar around this big building, which is still there. It's been renovated, but it's still there. Um, so the, uh, and the building was acquired uh, by Kanat or brought into Kanat because for penicillin production during World War II. Anyway, um, so the, um, the Spadina building became the focus of solving the problem of how to produce Salk's inactivated polio vaccine on a larger scale. In 53, recognizing Kanat's experience in developing large scale vaccine and biological production technologies, uh, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis for the March of Dimes financed a major pilot project to cultivate polio virus in large quantities. And this key to this effort is to grow the polio virus in larger containers was Dr. Leon, Leona Farrell who had considerable experience with large scale production of vaccines. And if you've, I've been involved with several articles over the last uh, year or so or less so that have highlighted Dr. Farrell's story, uh, including one for the New York Times back in uh, last July and the one in the Star, I think that was in uh, September. And then uh, I recently wrote an article for the Canadian Encyclopedia, uh, a little short biographical piece on Dr. Farrell. So you can look that up if you want. So she's just a really a key, key figure to this whole story from the Canadian point of view. So Dr. Farrell was among a small group of women uh, of her generation to earn a PhD in the sciences. Her, uh, her PhD was in the 30s. <laughs> she was a true pioneer in the, in the lab, innovative in her work and inspirational in her dedication to it. In 1939-40, she developed a new deep culture method of rocking cell cultivation or the Toronto method for the bulk production of toxin in a, li in a liquid semi-synthetic cell nutrient mixture. So involved larger bottles and a liquid media that, that moved. And so there's more aeration, it was a more efficient method to grow cells. So in the early 40s, she adapted this deep culture Rocky method for the production of pertussis vaccine. In 53, building on her experience with deep culture production, Farrell adapted the Toronto method to the production of poliovirus fluids using medium 199 to cultivate the virus in monkey kidney cells in large Pavitsky bottles, uh, which were incubated on custom built rocking machines. And in July 1953, in the wake of the worst polio epidemic year in US history, 1952 was a major, one of its worst, uh, and encouraged by Salk and, and Kanat's progress, the National Foundation asked the labs to provide all of the poliovirus fluids required for an unprecedented controlled field trial of soft inactivated vaccine, which would hopefully start in the spring. And meanwhile, Canada's worst polio epidemic year was just starting, which I've talked about a little earlier, 1953. So 53, 54, while the polio emergency worsened, Connaught undertook, as Jonas Salk described it to the lab's director, Dr. DeFries, the Herculean task of producing over 3000 liters of polyvirus fluids for what would be the largest vaccine field trial ever attempted. Poliovirus fluids were shipped to two US pharmaceutical firms by station wagon for inactivation and processing into the finished vaccine in time for the immunizations to start in April, 1954. So in 54, 55, then focused its efforts on the full preparation of vaccine for eventual Canadian use, pending the results of the field trial. So April 24th, 1954, launch of the, of the trial big cover story on time, you can see here. Uh, so 1,800,000 children were enrolled across the US in this trial, about 41 sta 44 states. Also in parts of Alberta, Manitoba and Halifax during the trial in May, along with parts of Finland. And for this triple, draw, triple blind field trial, children received either the vaccine, a placebo of one, which was 199, or were observed. Meanwhile, Kanaw proceeded to prepare the full vaccine while the federal and provincial governments planned an all Canadian observed control trial of it that would start in April, 1955, regardless of the US results. Each batch of the vaccine was double tested by Connaught and the Laboratory of Hygiene in Ottawa. So you get a sense of the, some of the press coverage here, all virus for US polio inoculations made at Connaught Labs. Fast forward a year, 
April 12th, 1955, V-Day, it was called. Uh, unpre there was unprecedented media attention to the announcement of the field trial results. Salk vaccine was 60 to 90% effective against the three types of poliovirus. So there was type one, two, and three, each of which could cause the disease. Um, the vaccine was immediately licensed in the US and Canada. And in Canada, the Salk vaccine was distributed through a unique federal provincial free program for children and subjected to further study of its effectiveness. So headlines like this were, were everywhere. Although it's too late for the man there as this picture kind of juxtaposes the, the big news of the vaccine with the impact of the disease. And by this time, there's quite a lot of more adults and he's in a portable respirator, portable iron lung, I guess you could say. However, April 25th, there was a major setback when it was discovered that some batches of vaccine from one US producer, Cutter Labs in California, were not fully inactivated, leading to some, ultimately some 79 polio cases uh, that were linked to the bad batches. On May 7th, after first recalling all of Cutter's vaccine and then setting up a national polio surveillance system, the US Surgeon General suspended the entire US vaccine program. North of the border, the burning question, what, was, what should Canada do? So, well, the US launch of the Salk vaccine was suspended after careful consideration and advice, yet some resistance from the prime minister as well. Federal Health Minister Paul Martin, as we've mentioned before, he himself a polio victim, and, and as was his son, so he was very familiar with the disease um, and very familiar with the whole Connaught Labs and everything else that was going on. He decided that Canadian launch of the vaccine should continue uninterrupted. There have been no reports of cases linked to Connaught's vaccine and immunization continued uninterrupted without incidents. Uh, Connaught was the only supplier. There was no US vaccine coming in. There was no reason to be concerned really. And moreover, a detailed Canadian evaluation of the vaccine further demonstrated its safety and effectiveness. There was considerable debate uh, ensued over the different approaches to the vaccine between the two countries. The Canadian success meant a lot to Dr. Salk and led to a full-scale immunization programs in the US finally restored. So I have lots of, just the difference in the Canadian approach was quite, quite stark, um, not only around the vaccine, but just much more role of the governments involved with polio supports and so forth. Um, while the Americans, it was very much March of Dimes only. There wasn't a whole lot of government involvement. Uh, very much relied on the voluntary efforts of the March of Dimes, as good as that was, but there still wasn't a real involvement of the governments, any real, compared to what was happening here. By 1957, Connaught was able to export vaccine to Czechoslovakia and Great Britain. Uh, was able to produce enough to uh, meet only not only Canadian needs, but able to export and was actually a unique, a unique position to do that. Connaught was soon exporting vaccine to the 44 other countries that were without protection against polio's growing global threat. Despite the successful introduction of the Salk vaccine in Canada, it took time for all age groups to be immunized and time for, the pol for polio outbreaks to finally end. In 58-59 in particular, a significant polio epidemic struck several parts of the country primarily affecting unimmunized preschool and older children as well as adults. So basically the focus at first was on the most vulnerable, uh, not unlike with COVID, I guess you can say with the COVID vaccine rollout, they focus on your most vulnerable. And meanwhile, it, it exposes the most, uh, the less vulnerable at the time, but then un unimmunized. And this is exactly what happened with polio. Very young children that were below the uh, targeted group and older people were beyond it. And they were the ones that were generating outbreaks. So. Um, so that was a significant challenge. So a way to deal with that, uh, building on the DPT or diphtheria pertussis tetanus combined vaccine kind of core model, designed to immunize and minimize injections, cannot pioneered a new generation of combined vaccines that included the sub polio vaccine, such as DPT polio or DT polio or T tetanus polio. And 55 to 62 Canadian polio incidents falls dramatically but not without some significant outbreaks where I mentioned where immunization rates among adults and young children were low. And persistent polio incidents during the late 50s also highlighted the limits of the Salk vaccine itself. Growing polio incidents internationally pointed to the need for another type of polio vaccine that was cheaper to produce and could more be more easily given. Uh, and Salk vaccine, the Salk vaccine stimulated blood immunity but Dr. Albert Sabin focused on preparing a vaccine that would build immunity in the digestive tract where the polio virus naturally replicated. And Sabin's goal was to carefully cultivate live attenuated or weakened poliovirus strains, which would be administered with a spoon orally. Uh, 
So beginning in 59, seed pools were provided by Dr. Sabin to, of the University of Cincinnati to Connaught. And in 6061, uh, oral polio vaccine field demonstrations were conducted in Nova Scotia and Quebec and Saskatchewan, basically to kind of test to see how stable the, uh, the attenuated virus strains were and, and to see how the, the impact of the immunity uh, against polio. And in March 1962, Connaught's trivalent Sabin oral vaccine was licensed in Canada. And uh, similar to what happened once the uh, Salk vaccine had been introduced, Connaught played a major role in exporting it, oral vaccine. Beginning in 61, when Connaught supplied some 3 million doses of oral vaccine to Japan to bring a polio epidemic under control. And Connaught began to export oral polio vaccine to other countries, becoming a world leader in the battle against polio uh, globally. In several provinces and most of the United States soon switched to oral, the oral, polio, oral vaccine, although the Salk vaccine was preferred in Ontario and Nova Scotia. In 1994, all provinces had switched back to the use of the Salk vaccine. There was a new enhanced potency version and a new combination uh, TPT polio Hib, Mophilus influenza B, which is a type of uh, meningitis in very young children. So by 1965, polio incidents in Canada had fallen to almost zero. So you can see this graph here. By the time the oral vaccine was introduced in 1962, polio epidemics in Canada were basically done. There hadn't, hasn't been anything really since then. Uh, a few, a few uh, you know, small sort of isolations or outbreaks. But by uh, 1994, um, polio was officially declared eradicated in, in Canada. Um, you can see here we have wild, the last wild uh, case was in like 1988. Uh, well, but otherwise they've been uh, vaccine associated or imported. So this, in, despite wide international use of both types of vac polio vaccine, the disease remained endemic in most of the world with some 300 cases per year, like 1988. So with incredible progress, while incredible progress had been made since the WHO's polio eradication program began in 1988, Thanks in large part to Rotary, Rotary International and Canadian support, polio remains a persistent and expensive global threat if polio immunization levels lapse. So just to give you a sense of that. Despite many setbacks and challenges, the Canadian government has remained a strong supporter of polio eradication program, further supported by notable Canadians with direct polio experience, such as Neil Young and Paul Martin Jr. and Ramesh Ferris, who you might've seen. He's been very effective. He's, he lives up in the Yukon. He did a national tour back in 2008, uh, and uh, he had polio in, in India. He was adopted by a family in the Yukon, and he's been very active uh, in, in, in the polio eradication, polio eradication and, and sort of uh, awareness. Uh, between 1985 and 2002, Canada contributed some $27.19 million to the eradication program. That number rose between 2003 and 2005 to over $100 million. And then from 2006 to 2016, another $452 million. And uh, by June 20, 2017, committed another $100 million. So it's been an ongoing uh, significant uh, contribution. Indeed, Canada has been the fourth highest contrib contributing nation to the polio eradication initiative, under below the US, UK, and Germany. And so between 85 and 2019, over $600 million. And though this slides a couple of years old, it's the COVID pandemic has complicated things, but I think that those contribution levels have been maintained. Um, I've had a chance to check that. And then just to give you a sense of where we are today as poliovirus, while poliovirus is eliminated, new challenges persist, such as circulating live virus virus, live vaccine virus, and the risk of re its reversion to virulence. So the, I mean, the, the oral vaccine that has inherent risks, as you probably know, because it's live, it can it reproduces in the gut, and normally that's fine. But in certain circumstances, those those um, that reproduction of the virus can lead to a reversion if you have immunocompromised pro people or uh, certain populations. Um, and so that's what you can see on this map. The green dots um, are uh, based on cases linked to um, to the vaccine more than the wild virus. So today, more polio cases are due to the circulating vaccine-derived polio virus than wild poliovirus. The wild virus is the red ones. And only, that's only been in two, two countries, um, um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, you can see there. And then 
you can just see a sense. So this is uh, this is from the uh, polio eradication website and you get a sense. So that's, there's still some challenges and obviously the, the COVID pandemic has, has sort of another monkey wrench. <laughs> there's been, uh, in the whole history of the eradication program, there's been several kind of monkey wrenches thrown into the, into the process that have you know, uh, delayed the whole eradication program, complicating Rotary's role, um, requiring further work from Rotary particularly, including things like terrorism, you know, and uh, active, active resistance, active bombings and so on of vaccinators. So it's a real tragedy in many cases for that to still be happening. Anyway, so polio was and certainly remains an enigma. So a number of ways I've talked about just the epidemics itself and continuing challenges with it. Um, Canada's polio experience was distinctive in its severity and how it helped shape Canada's public health system and in the critical role of Canadian science and biotechnology played in understanding and controlling and ultimately eradicating the crippler. So that's, a, that's me in an exhibit I toured with back in 2005 um, through Sanofi. So, and on many levels, the polio epidemics and vaccine story resonates today in the COVID-19 pandemic, which as, as I've gone through this, you can probably recognize this by our own experience through the last year. So I've done quite a bit of media. This is a, an article from about a year ago, actually, almost directly a year ago. Uh, so there's been a number of, uh, lots of media interest at different times of the epidemic on different aspects of relating polio and polio vaccines to the COVID story. So, and with that, thank you very much, everybody. Okay.